Hey guys, welcome back to Weld.com. So today we're going to do a comprehensive safety video on the proper use of a right angle grinder. Stick around. What you're watching right now is a video on how not to use an angle grinder correctly. Everything I'm doing right now is completely wrong. Nothing about it is right. I highly recommend that you don't attempt to work like this at home or in the shop. What I do recommend is you hit pause, drop down to the comments section, and list as many safety violations as you can find in the video. Once you're done, hit resume play and we'll be right here waiting for you to show you how to use it correctly. All right, so the angle grinder is typically used in a lot of work applications, especially involved with welding. So you're gonna be cutting, you're gonna be grinding, you're gonna be polishing, you're gonna be blending. So I mean, it's, it's a big part of your arsenal as a welder uh, or as a fitter, as a helper. You're gonna be using this quite a bit. Aside from your welding machine, this is probably one of the, uh, the number one items you're gonna have in your toolbox and you're gonna use it quite a bit at work, right? 80% of your work's gonna be preparation. 20% of it's gonna actually be the welding. So this is where the preparation comes in. Before we get into grinding, one thing you definitely wanna make sure of is that you're doing it in a safe place. So you wanna make sure that the work area that you're gonna be utilizing the grinder in is free of solvents. You don't have any chemicals laying around. All your cardboard, trash, and wood's been picked up. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when you use a grinding wheel, you project sparks that are in excess of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That's hot enough to burn your skin melt paper, set chemicals on fire. So do some general housekeeping. Make sure you know your coworkers are out of the way, wherever you're gonna be directing your sparks, make sure that area is clean, free of debris, and you're ready to have, you know, you got a nice safe work area that you know, you're gonna be able to, to do all your cutting and grinding work in, and you're not gonna cause injury to yourself or someone else. So before we get into that, let's go ahead and talk about some of the proper protective equipment that we wanna consider when we're gonna be using the grinder. You want to have eight inch work boots, you know, preferably steel toe. I like steel toe. You can do composite, but uh, if your company requires it, you know, use that. But just make sure you have some leather boots. Uh, next up, you want to make sure you have like denim or wool jeans. I prefer denim. That's just my choice. Again, uh, cotton shirts, you want to stay away from anything that's synthetic. So in, any synthetic fibers, because like I said before, 1800 degree sparks, you're going to catch yourself on fire. You're going to melt your clothes, your gloves, whatever. So make sure whatever uh, equipment you have on underneath the regular clothing is fire retardant. So natural fibers versus synthetic. So think wools, denims, uh, duck, all that good stuff, khaki. Next you wanna, you know, we're gonna dress for the actual application. So I have a uh, welding jacket or an FR clothes. I prefer a welding jacket um, because if you have a regular t-shirt on, it's not gonna provide enough coverage. We'll get into it a little bit further, but uh, grinding wheels can actually, you know, get sucked up in your clothing. So if you do have a long t-shirt on, you want to make sure you tuck that in. I like welding jackets because they provide a little bit more protection. If something was to go wrong or the grinder was to wrap itself up in your clothing, welding jackets are thicker than your regular t-shirt. So it's going to be able to stop that tool a lot faster if for some reason something happens. Cover up your head, man. Cover that grape of yours, right? Especially if you're doing overhead grinding, you want to keep that covered. Keep the sparks out. Anytime you're dealing with a grinder or any other power tool that's gonna to make a lot of noise, you're gonna to wanna to wear some sort of hearing protection. Not only that, it's gonna block sparks from getting in your ears. Today I actually have a, head, a set of headphones in made by Isotunes, and they meet the requirements of OSHA and NIOSH, so they can actually be used in the workplace as hearing protectors as well. Cameraman's gonna put a link down in the description if you're interested in checking them out. Obviously, we're gonna use safety glasses. You should be using safety glasses for everything you do in the shop. And then a pair of uh, good quality leather gloves. Now, if you're thinking, um, you know, I don't, I don't wear gloves because I don't want to get them caught up in the grinder. We're going to teach you how to use the grinder the correct way. And when you use it the correct way, you have two hands on the grinder at all times, right? So you can't get your gloves caught in the grinder if they're nowhere near the disc while it's spinning, right? The next thing, in addition to your safety glasses, you want to make sure that you have a good quality face shield. Okay, these should be rated uh, Z87.1 or Z87 Plus through ANSI. I have a beard guard on this one because I have a beard. And most people ask me, how do I keep from getting it burnt up? I use this piece of leather right here to keep, uh, keep this thing in pristine condition. So make sure you have a good quality face shield. Now, depending on the work environment you're going to be in, there's different types of face shields available. So general shop work where I have a uh, well-ventilated area, I don't have to worry about overhead hazards. 
this is a good face shield, right? You can get one just like this. You want something that's gonna protect your face. You have to wear safety glasses in addition to this, right? In addition to your face shield, you wanna make sure you have safety glasses. Next up, we have one for you guys that are working out in the field. This is one with a hard hat attachment or a hard hat halo. So you put that on, boom, right? We're all safety up. What I've done on this is I've actually put a magnet on here with some double stick tape. So if you're out in the field, you're doing some overhead grinding, all that grinding dust should collect in this area because once you lift this flap up here, all that dust can then fall into your face. A small breeze will blow it right in your eyes. Next thing you know, you're on your way to the opto or optometrist to get that stuff removed. You don't want that to happen. So little tip, throw a magnet on there, right? It's a neodymium or a rare earth magnet, so it'll collect any of those dust particles. You get, you get enough built up on there, you can blow it off. All right, so the next one we have, this is a, a PAPR system. Good afternoon, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at an altitude of 39,000 feet. Folks, kick back and enjoy the flight. So these are great if you're working in, you know, confined spaces, you don't have good ventilation, or you're generating a lot of uh, grinding fumes. If you're working on exotic metals like uh, stainless or aluminum or titanium, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. If you have to grind a lot of galvanized off, this is what I would recommend. Uh, probably. This would be my preference over a respirator for obvious reasons. But this one is a Pure Flow by Gentex, and it was sent to us from uh, Fram Safety. So go ahead and check those guys out. Thanks for sending this to us so we could have a visual aid for the video and then uh, show, show you guys how to use this system. But this actually goes over your head. It has a FR cape that goes around there to protect your neck, beard, all that stuff. Nice little drawstring on there so you can keep everything nice and close and then tuck that up out of the way, obviously. And then you have full access so you can open this up, talk to your coworkers. It has a filtration system in the back, so it's, you're getting purified air uh, brought into your welding hood. So you don't have to worry about things fogging up with this because it keeps your head nice and cool. Uh, we're gonna do some demonstrations with this a little bit later in the video. So now that we know to keep our work area clean, we know what we're supposed to wear, let's go ahead and talk about the grinding setup. All right, so let's talk about the actual grinder that we're gonna use. The first thing you wanna do when you pick this up, you wanna know uh, what type of grinder it is. So this is a four and a half inch angle grinder. So anything uh, that I'm doing, that's the, the appropriate size wheel that I need to be putting on here. In addition to that, I wanna check the housing in the head, make sure there's no cracks, nothing's exposed, all the fasteners on here, nothing's loose, nothing's out of the ordinary. The arbor lock works. I wanna make sure that the trigger mechanism works. Obviously I'm unplugged right now. So I'm gonna test that and make sure that that's not locked by what they call the, uh, the trigger lock or the suicide switch. Okay, again, we've got some pictures at the end of the video. Might wanna stick around and uh, check that out because some people decided to use the suicide lock. You'll see, go check it out. We also wanna go through and check out the cord that's on here, okay, the cable. Make sure there's no nicks, cuts, frays, anything, exposed wires. You don't want any of that because if I plug this into the power source and I touch the cord, it's electrically hot, I'm gonna get zapped. In addition, you want it, this is a three prong cord. You wanna make sure all the prongs are there, okay? So one thing to note, if you can't take this thing and, and just like whip it like a bull whip and it land in the electrical outlet, don't yank it out from back here. Whenever you unplug it, you wanna make sure that you unplug it from the end of the cable, and that's how you should plug it in. That's how that grounding cable or that grounding lead gets pulled out, right? So a lot of, a lot of grinders are missing that because people just yank them when they're done at the end of the day, and that pops out. So once I'm sure that this thing is serviceable, what I wanna do is I wanna start putting it together. Now there's a handle that comes with your grinder, okay? This is one of the items along with the guard that gets thrown out. As soon as somebody opens the box, they pull the grinder out, they throw the handle away, throw the guard away, they put a disc on there and they go to work, right? Wrong, don't do that. Take the handle and mount it to the grinder. Okay, next up, this is a four and a half inch grinder, so I'm gonna make sure that I put a four and a half inch guard on here. I don't wanna put a five inch or a six inch. Make sure you put the appropriate size guard on there. All right, every guard is gonna mount a little bit different, so make sure you consult your manual for the specific piece of equipment that you own to make sure you're mounting the guard on there properly. Okay, they're also, a lot of these, I like these because they have little quick locks on them, so I can actually rotate the guard to where I need it to be and it'll, it'll lock in place, okay? A little push button back there, I can move it around, whether I'm cutting or grinding, I can select the appropriate 
uh, orientation for this guard. Okay, now that the guard's in place, uh, the only thing left as far as the setup are the, the ferrule or the bushing and the locking nut. I'm gonna hold off on these because depending on the type of wheel that you're gonna use, you're gonna use a different type of nut and you're gonna use a different side of the nut. So we're gonna go on, we're gonna cover that next. So depending on the type of material you'll be working on, whether it's aluminum, stainless steel, or carbon steel, you're gonna wanna make sure you pick the appropriate disc. So these discs are designed specifically for aluminum cutting and grinding. You don't wanna use these on steel because they're just not gonna last as long. Likewise, I don't wanna use a steel disc on aluminum because it's gonna tear it up. In addition, the aluminum is gonna clog the pores on the outside of this grinding wheel. In addition to that, if you have an aluminum soaked wheel, you start grinding on heavy rust, you're gonna create something called thermate. Thermate is very similar to thermite and it's highly flammable. So you don't wanna cause that, uh, <clears throat> that condition in your shop. Next thing we wanna consider is what size wheel are we gonna use? We pick the size wheel based on the size of the grinder that we're gonna use. Even though I can put a six inch guard on this grinder because they're interchangeable, I don't wanna put a six inch wheel on this grinder. And that's because this wheel is rated for 10,200 RPMs. Now this grinder's kicking out 11,000 RPMs. What would be a more appropriate selection is to choose a six inch grinder for this six inch wheel. Now this is a very versatile grinder because this is capable of running four and a half, five inch and six inch wheels because it's rated for 9,000 RPMs and the 9,000 RPMs doesn't exceed any of the speeds that I can use for any one of these discs. So this one's 10,200, this one's 13,300. All these wheels have a higher RPM rating than this grinder is actually capable of putting out. So it's gonna max out at 9,000 RPMs. Any one of these wheels on here is gonna be safe to use. If I do switch to a five or a four inch wheel, I wanna make sure that I reduce the size of my guard. So if I'm gonna use a five inch wheel, I wanna put a five inch guard on here and take that six inch off. Same thing with a four and a half. I would actually take this four and a half inch guard, put it on here, then I could use that four and a half inch wheel. This is probably one of the better grinders you can get, not specifically this brand, but this type of grinder that's capable of running the three different types of wheels versus one grinder that can only run four and a half. The great thing about this is it's much smaller, it's compact, easier to use, lightweight. So, I mean, choose what's gonna work best for your shop and your application. Once I figured out the type of, uh, the size of the wheel that I'm gonna use, the type of material I'm gonna be working on, I wanna figure out what type of wheel I need to use based on purpose. What, what's the task at hand? What job am I doing? So if I wanna do some like stock removal, I'm gonna use this wheel right here. It's a quarter inch thick wheel and it's meant for stock removal, heavy grinding. And I'm gonna use this at that 30 degree angle. I don't wanna use it on the edge because it doesn't have any reinforcement in here. What it's gonna do is it's gonna erode back, it's gonna chip, you're gonna get chunks out of there and then you're gonna compromise the integrity of the wheel and then it could potentially come apart on you during use. Same thing with this flapper wheel, okay? If I'm going to prep material, polish it up, blend it, any of those things, I can go ahead and select as, uh, the flapper disc. Now when I use this, I wanna make sure that I maintain that 30 degree angle. Notice there's really no abrasive out here. There's no reinforcement. I don't have any, anything there that's gonna protect the edge of this wheel. It's not meant to be used that way. I don't wanna go in and try to clean out a groove weld with this. It's meant for flat to 30 degrees. That's where I wanna to try to keep that. That's the range I wanna keep it in. When I'm using that, I wanna to try to keep it at about that angle right there when I'm going through the material. Now, if I do wanna use edge grinding, a cutoff wheel is simply gonna to be too thin, right? I have reinforcement on the outside, but I have no reinforcement here. So I don't wanna use a cutoff wheel as a grinding wheel, okay? I can use the edge, but this is a little too thin. So if I wanted to grind out a root pass or remove a weld, I'm actually gonna switch out and I'm gonna get an eighth inch wheel. And it tells me right on the wheel that I can use it at a 90 degree angle so I can go in and I can cut into the material this way, but I can also dress it up. So I can use this at a 45 degree angle or zero, zero to 45 this way, because this wheel is designed to have reinforcement and abrasive material on the edge, as well as on the face of the disc. So this would be a good option for that. Likewise, when I get into uh, rust removal and I wanna use a wire wheel, this cup here is great for cleaning up the surface, 
but it's going to be horrible trying to get into a groove. That's not what it's designed for, so keep this as flat as you can against the material. Now, if I do want to get into a groove or a tight corner, this is what I'm going to use, and this is the edge of the, uh, the wheel that I want to put against the material. It's going to clean up a lot better that way, and it's not meant to run at that 30 degree angle or in the flat position. Okay, it's going to start falling apart. These things are going to become uh, off-centered. Once it becomes off-centered, it's going to be unbalanced, and then it's a hazard. Okay, so keep some of those things in mind whenever you're, you're picking out a, uh, a wheel. Make sure you are using the appropriate wheel for the task at hand, and we're actually going to show you exactly how to use each one of these wheels a little bit further in the video. Once we figure out the type of disc that we're going to be using, the type of material that uh, we're going to be cutting or grinding on, once we select that wheel, we want to check the wheel for serviceability. So one thing we want to look at is if any of the wheels have ever been wet, left out in the rain, automatically throw them in the trash, right? Destroy them, get rid of them. Also, anytime you have rust on it, so if you have a wire wheel or you have any of these ferrule or the, any of these uh, locking nuts that, that go on there, if any of it's caked over with oxidization because it's been left out, get rid of them, okay? It's just not worth the hassle. It's not worth your safety. Uh, go through the cutoff wheel. Make sure there's no nicks, dings, uh, scratches, or grooves in there. So here's a prime example. So this one was probably left on a grinder. The grinder fell off the table and it chipped the side of the wheel. Now this whole disc is compromised. Doesn't mean stick it in the grinder and like cut it until that part wears out. Here's what could happen. Just get rid of it. Now what I used to typically do is if I'd find a wheel that was um, that was pretty bad, messed up, I would go ahead and just break it, get rid of it. Now I've prevented the next user from coming up and using that. Same thing with a hard rock. You can beat these up with a hammer, throw them in the trash. But this one, again, this has been dinged up. It was used improperly or you know it got damaged during shipping or it fell off the table in an excessive amount of times, whatever. The exterior of this edge has been compromised. Okay, I don't want to use that. Okay, go ahead and get rid of that one. Throw that in the trash. This guy right here, just talking about wheels, you know, continuing on. I'm missing some pads on here. Something happened to this. The camera guy mistook this for his, uh, for his sandwich for lunch and chewed on it. I don't know what happened here, but I'm not going to put this on a grinder that's going to run about 9,000 to 11,000 RPMs and try to use that because the structural integrity of it has been compromised. So get rid of it. If you have any doubts whether it's going to be a good wheel or not, trash it. Okay, you're, you're going to thank me for it later. Same thing with a wire wheel. Obviously, this thing has seen better days, okay? I'm not gonna throw this on a grinder. This is going into the trash. Uh, it's, it's all kinds of jacked up. Things aren't spaced out correctly. I've got damage to some of the, uh, the twisted ends. Go ahead and get rid of it. It's, it's not worth risking, you know? Even if it's the last one you got in your gang box, you know, run out and get another one, you know, radio the boss man, tell me you need some other stuff. Don't use it, guys, okay? Get rid of this stuff, it's gonna hurt you. All right, let's talk about mounting these wheels up. So as you know, there's different types of wheels available. So what I have right here is called a Type 27, and it's a quarter inch wheel. Then I have your regular flapper wheel. This already has a mounted nut in here. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually not gonna need any hardware to mount this or the wire wheel because they both have the mounted nuts. The cutoff wheel, however, is called a Type 1 cutoff wheel. You'll notice it's flush on both sides. Whereas the Type 27, has a depressed center. Depressed meaning it's very sad. No, but on a serious note, it has this raised portion on the wheel, whereas the Type 1 is completely flat on both sides. So because of that, we're gonna have two different types of mounting that we're gonna do with this. So let's go ahead and start off with the quarter inch wheel. We're gonna start off with our backing flange or ferrule, and you'll notice that it has straight edges on two of the sides. Also, you'll notice on the arbor, I have two flat sides here. I'm going to pair these up and put the flat sides together so that that wash or that ferrule locks into that arbor. Next, I'll place the wheel on top of it and make sure the wheel is sitting center of that ferrule. And then I'm going to put the top nut on here. Now you'll notice on the top nut, it has a edge that has a flare on it. This is a raised edge right here. This is the side that I'm going to put up against the wheel. And I know that because it says, quarter inch wheel, this side against wheel. So I'm going to flip it over and I'll screw it down that way. 
This ensures that the wheel is locked in and is as secure as it can be. Now I'm going to go ahead and push the button on the back to lock the arbor in place and spin the wheel till it's locked. You can follow this up with a grinder wrench that should come with your grinder. You don't want to crank down on it, just put a little bit of snug in there, about a quarter turn, and you should be good to go. Now, to, and notice the wheel sits behind the guard. It sits on the inside. That's where you want it. We'll go ahead and do the reverse to take this apart or take this back off. Now let's go ahead and attempt to mount the wire wheel. So because it has this nut already molded into it from the factory, if I were to put this up against that ferrule, you'll notice that the wire brush is slightly exposed outside the guard. I don't want that. That guard's supposed to protect me. So what I'm going to do, very carefully, because the wire wheels bite, I'm going to take that ferrule off of the back. Now I can put that same wheel back on, and notice it sits inside the guard. I also have full thread engagement with that arbor. Same thing with the zerk wheel. We're going to mount that without that ferrule on the back. So these are pretty simple. So if they have a nut on the back of them, take the ferrule completely out of the system, drop them in your pockets, don't lose them. Now let's move on to the cutting wheel. Now because this is a type 1 wheel, OSHA is now mandating that we should be using a type 1 guard, which is enclosed on two sides as well as a type 1 nut. Now notice, or type 1 ferrule. Notice this ferrule is much thicker than the ferrule we had been using. See, it's a lot thicker than the previous one. That's going to offset that so that wheel is not so close to the guard. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the guard out first. This one, actually, uh, you have to swap this out with a screwdriver. So I'm going to loosen that nut, or loosen that bolt, spin the guard, Take that one off and then put the new guard on top. Once it's in place, simply lock it down. Okay, now this guard's ready to go. <clears throat> I'll then take the type 1 ferrule, set it right on, make sure it locks into place. Take the type 1 cutting wheel, put it to the inside, and then follow this back up with a nut. Now notice I'm going to use the opposite side of the nut this time. This side is completely flushed. It doesn't have that raised center that I need to deal with. So I'm going to put the flush side up against the wheel, push the, uh, the button on the back again to lock the arbor in place, follow that up with the wrench, snug it up. Again, don't put these on too tight. Rotate the guard into the position where I'm going to be doing all my cutting, lock it in, and I'm ready to do my cutting. And now I'm protected. If this disc does explode, it's going to shield me in two different directions. So I have less area where that, that wheel can come apart and come at me. Also notice that the wheel is now sitting further in from the guard, whereas before, if I would have used that other, that type 27 nut, I'd be right close to that guard. I don't want to be there. I want to be further out. So this type 1 guard and this type 1 nut on the type 1 wheel allows everything to be pushed out more towards the center, and this type 1 guard keeps everything in place and keeps me a lot safer than a typical 27 guard meant for a 27 wheel. Fun fact. During the whole mounting demonstration, the grinder was unplugged the whole time while I was swapping the wheels in and out. You always want to make sure to unplug the grinder anytime you're swapping out the wheels. One thing I used to do as an educator, and I learned actually when I was uh, in the field working, if you take the wrench that's required to uh, tighten that nut and loosen it, and just zip tie it right to the end of the power cord, Right where, right where it gets plugged in at. This forces the operator to unplug the device in order to be able to access the wrench and bring it up there. Make sure you put it on there pretty snug, you know, that way it doesn't slide up and down the cord and you should be good to go. So instructors, try that. If you guys are using the wrenches, it also keeps them from losing the wrench. So, I mean, you can keep track of your wrenches uh, and then they'll be able to swap those in and out without any problem. And it'll always remind them, unplug it before they do it. All right, thus far we've talked about cleaning up your work area, making sure you've got a safe place to work. We've talked about dressing the part. Okay, so as you can see, fully dressed and everything I need, aside from my gloves and face shield, but I don't have my grinder in my hands yet. Uh, we've made, uh, we figured out the type of material we're gonna cut or we're gonna grind on. Figured out the best wheel for that application. Now uh, we figured out how to mount it to, uh, to the grinder, whether it's a type one or a type 27 configuration. 
Uh, we've talked about making sure that the wheels are serviceable in good condition, inspection of the grinder, all that good stuff. So now we're going to put everything together and we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about technique and operating each different type of wheel uh, that you might encounter. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to start off with a cutting wheel. Now remember, this wheel is designed to cut, so it's going to be used on edge. You do not want to use that to grind anything off. I'm guilty of it myself. I've done it before. I'm sure some of you have. You cut something off and then you go to, you know, you just use the edge of that just to take the burr off. Don't do it, okay? Get rid of that bad habit. Uh, just get in the habit of switching the wheel over. Uh, a lot of times if I'm doing a lot of fab work, I'll have two or three different grinders set up and each grinder has a specific task. So I'll have a cutoff wheel on one, zerk wheel on another, and a wire wheel on another. Uh, if you don't have that luxury, just take the opportunity to swip, switch the disc back and forth. It's not worth it. Quick story that's kind of relevant to cutoff wheels. Father's Day, probably seven years ago, I got a phone call. My dad tried to cut a piece of chain, had all the appropriate PPE on there, had the guard in place. It was a Type 27 guard, but the, uh, the, the nut that was uh, supposed to secure the wheel on there wasn't the appropriate nut. It actually had a conical shape to it. So the wheel was on there. He had just picked up the, guard, or the, uh, the grinder to cut a piece of chain, fired it up, let it hit the max RPMs like you're supposed to, went to cut the piece of chain, the wheel came apart, uh, the disc broke into several pieces, uh, a couple of the pieces ended up into his uh, abdomen. One of them they actually had to go through his abdomen and intestines and pull it out of his spine, it was so far back. So these things are nothing to mess with, so don't, don't take the risk, it's not worth it. Make sure it's serviceable, put a guard on the grinder, and wear the appropriate PPE, okay? It's not even, it's not even a joke. Everybody says, I can't get the guard, and you know, I, got to, I have the guard on there, but I can't get into certain applications. The grinder just won't fit. Well, you, at that point, you're probably using the wrong tool. You need to select the appropriate tool for the job, select the appropriate uh, abrasive for the task at hand, and select the appropriate PPE, right? The more you know, guys. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. We're gonna go ahead and use the, um, the cutoff wheel. We're gonna cut a piece of channel here, and we'll just kind of move through the different types of wheels and show you the exact uh, techniques to operate them safe and efficiently. Okay guys, before we get into this and start talking about each wheel individually, there's something I want to note um, about all the wheels, okay? This is going to apply across all the board, whether it's a cutting wheel, a flap disc, a hard rock, eighth inch hard rock, wire wheel, there's something you always want to pay attention to. The first one obviously is going to be the speed. Make sure the wheel matches the rotation or is greater than the rotation of the tool that you're going to be working with. The next one we want to talk about is pressure. I see so many times people are burning up grinders and burning up discs because they're, you know, they're really putting their weight into it and going ham on it. Just relax, okay? Let the tool do the work. You want to put light pressure on there, just enough to get the job done. The harder you push on the wheel, the less work it's going to do, okay? Because what you're doing, you're heating that abrasive up. That, at that point, you're compromising the adhesive that they're put all that uh, <clears throat> the aggregate and the abrasives in there. You're, you're compromising the integrity of that. So just Back it off a little bit, relax. We're just grinding here or you know, cutting, so don't force the wheel into it. Let the wheel do the work. The next, always pay attention to your angles. A lot of them are listed on the, uh, the edge of the, or the face of the disc. You know, it'll tell you if you'll, it'll run at a 90 degree, five degree, 30 degree, 45. Pay attention because that's the way the wheel was designed to be used. So make sure you pay attention to the angle. The next one, pay attention to your wear patterns. You know, we're gonna talk about different wear patterns on some of the wheels. If the wheel's too small to be used or you know, damaged or you know, it's just kind of past its expiration date, meaning it's been used way too much or it was used improperly before you got a hold of it, go ahead and switch the wheel out. Okay, so before we go ahead to use the tool, we're gonna make sure it's in the off position, okay? If it has a, uh, a trigger lock or a mechanism where it's just on and off, make sure it's in the off position before you plug it in. Okay, so it's completely turned off. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. If you don't do that, here's what could happen. All right, so to use this wheel, it's gonna spin in a clockwise direction from where I'm standing right now. This little arrow right here tells me the arrow is gonna, or the wheel is gonna spin this way. So what I'm gonna do is I will, once both hands are safely on the grinder, I'm gonna hit the power switch, I'm gonna turn it on, and I'm going to drag this down the material for the first part of the cut. And I'm, what I wanna do is I just wanna continuously score that line out. I don't wanna try to push the grinder in there and cut like it's a skill saw on plywood. I'm removing small amounts of stock each time I go through it. You'll see it, it actually happens pretty quick, but I'm just gonna keep running this back and forth in that groove. I'll then transfer up here and continue that same motion 
and then I'll come over to the other side and, and run that same, same motion and cut this piece off. So as I'm cutting with this wheel, you kind of want to put an imaginary line through the center of it. This is the good side of the wheel over here. This is where I want to maintain and stay. It's less likely to uh, kick back and bite if I'm using this side of the wheel. If I switch over this way, because the wheel's running in a clockwise motion, if I get bound up, this thing's going to kick right back at me. So I don't want to flip it upside down and uh, use this side of the wheel, Okay, your, your right hand side of the wheel. I don't want to use that. I always want to try to stay over here as you're looking at it to the left hand side of that wheel. That's going to make things a lot safer. If I do get a kickback, it's going to pull the grinder away from me. So now I've rotated the guard. This is still the left hand side. This is the side that I want to cut with. I don't want to cut with this back, this, this side over here. We'll flip the guard around here in a minute and I'll kind of show you what that looks like. But again, looking at it, this is the left hand side of the wheel. As I'm cutting, the sparks are going to come back this way. You can orient the guard to where the sparks, you know, they're coming down at the floor so you can kind of stay out of the way of the fire. But because that, that wheel's uh, right now, it's running as you're looking at it, it's going to run in a counterclockwise fashion. Before, when you looked at it this way, it was running clockwise. Okay, but now in this way, it's going to be running counterclockwise just because of the orientation of the grinder. As I'm cutting, okay, the sparks are coming back this way. If for some reason the grinder binds up, it's gonna pull the grinder out of my hands, okay? So I'd rather be away from the grinder if it catches than for it to, if I flip everything over and cut with the other side of the wheel, it's gonna kick back and come at me. So now we're backwards. This is the side of the wheel that you don't wanna be cutting with. As I cut, the sparks are gonna go that way. The wheel's gonna be trying to force itself back this way. And if for some reason this wheel binds up, it's gonna kick back at the operator. Now this is only a four and a half inch wheel, but imagine if you've got a six, seven, or nine inch cutting wheel on here, okay? It's gonna kick back and it's gonna possibly cut you. So you wanna make sure the sparks, you can always orient the guard to where the sparks are hitting the floor. You can stay out of the firing line so the sparks are coming back at you once this is turned the opposite way. But this way right here, the sparks are gonna go that way. If this thing binds up, it's gonna kick back at me. You wanna avoid that. Now once I'm done, what I wanna do, this is called the foot of the grinder. Every single grinder has one. When I'm done with the grinder and I'm not using it, I'm going to set it on the table just like this. That's what it's designed for. See how it holds it nice and flat? I'm going to wait until it, it, uh, it completely stops before I set it down, set it down on the material on the table. Everything's good. You don't want to lay it down this way or on the wheel itself, okay? I'm going to lay it down on the foot. So that's a cutoff wheel. Now we're going to go ahead and move to a quarter inch hard rock. Anytime you guys are uh, doing any grinding or cutting, Make sure that the piece that you're working on is, is completely fixed or it's a fixed solid object, stationary, or clamped down. If you're using uh, small parts, put it in a vise, put it in a clamp. Two hands should be on the grinder at all times. You don't want to hold the piece of material with one hand and cut or grind with the other. Um, it's just not safe. So we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to clean this edge up here. Remember this disc right here, it tells me at the top it's designed to be used at a 45 degree angle. So we're going to clean this edge up. One thing to note is I can't use the back side of this wheel. There's no reinforcement, there's no abrasives in here. So when we get over to the, uh, this piece of channel that we're working on here, I'm gonna do this just for demonstrations only so the, uh, the camera guy can kind of point that out. You don't wanna use the top of the wheel while you're trying to clean this stuff up. You're actually gonna rotate it. The material, uh, the surface of the material should always be on, the, on the, uh, the front side of this wheel. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and swap this out. We're gonna switch over to a piece of 3 8 plate and we're gonna clean up some mill scale. Now, depending on the type of material you're going to be grinding on and the type of wheel, what you should do with any of the wheels that you're going to be working with is start and do a pull technique at first, and then you can start getting in and going back and forth. The reason is, if you try to push this in there and it bites in, it could cause the wheel to kick off and deflect. You don't want to do that. You could also chip the wheel. So start off and drag the piece across, kind of clean that up a little bit, and then you'll have a good feel for how that material and that wheel are going to interact with one another. So as you can see on this, I'm using a 45 degree work angle. I want to try to maintain the integrity of that wheel. That's what it's designed for. That's exactly how I want to use it. Try to maintain that 45 degree angle. As you pull back, your body is kind of going to get in that natural uh, rhythm, you know, as you're pulling it back across and it's going to keep you at that angle. So try not to jack it up too high with your elbow or, you know, drop it too low. Just 
try to keep that nice 45 degree angle. Or if you have a 30 degree angle disc, you know, try to keep it in that area as well. Okay, so uh, one little pro tip, uh, whether you know, you're using the grinder yourself or your students are or the people that are working for you, the thickness of this wheel, right? This is a quarter inch wheel. I should have about a quarter inch wear line right here throughout the entire life of this disc. Same thing if I have an eighth inch disc, it's gonna be an eighth inch wear line. That's gonna tell me that disc is being used correctly. It's not being used on its edge. They're maintaining that you know, 30 to 45 degree, whatever's recommended on the disc, but that wear line should remain constant throughout the life of this wheel. Let's go ahead and move on to the flap wheel. Again, we've unplugged it as we're switching wheels. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, push the button on the back here. Line that up, screw this down all the way. Lock it in place, and it, it doesn't, you know, there's, you can't use a wrench on this side. Just snug it up, pretty decent. Again, I wanna verify that the trigger lock's not in place. Okay, it's a paddle style trigger, so that the trigger's fully out. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in, and then we'll go ahead and show you how to use this. Okay, now with the uh, flapper wheel, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing. I'm gonna get the grinder up to the max RPMs, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull across this material, and we'll attempt to uh, put a bevel on it. This stuff's really good for material stock removal. It's not so great on mill scale removal just because everything gets kind of glazed over, um, but it's great for taking off corners, deburring edges, and blending welds, removing welds. Um, these things work awesome, but I'm just going to do a, a drag technique on here. Get it going full RPM, start here, and then pull that first one just to see how it's going to react with the material, and then we can run back and forth and try and get a decent bevel on here. As you can see with the, uh, the flapper disc on there, piece of steel, we were able to remove a lot of stock very quickly without compromising the wheel, making sure that we use it correctly. Everything turned out nice and smooth. And as you can see, the disc is still in good shape. Now what I'd like to do is run this same test. We're gonna switch over. I'm gonna take this disc off. I'm gonna put a brand new one on and we're gonna switch over and do a little bit of stainless. All right, so I went ahead and switched out the wheels. Uh, this was the one I was using on regular carbon steel. I put the same type of wheel, same type of flapper wheel, back on the grinder to do some stainless. Now in this situation, just because it's for instructional purposes, it's not gonna make a big difference. I could have continued to use this one on stainless steel, wouldn't have been a big issue. But I wanted to uh, kind of make note of the fact that since I use this on steel, this wheel is now saturated with iron. Now if I switch over and start grinding on stainless, as many of you may know, some of you may not, once I start grinding the stainless, I've now impregnated the stainless with the iron from the carbon steel once I get done with this piece, it could oxidize. So in order to eliminate that, anytime you use a wheel that's meant for stainless steel and steel, once you use it on steel, mark it steel only. Um, well, if it's only been used on stainless steel, mark it on stainless steel use only. That way, you know, you kind of remember which disc goes on what and where you can use them. Uh, so just try to avoid that. Ran into a situation where we were doing guardrails at Disney and one of the young apprentices used a, uh, a wheel that had already been used on steel we, uh, he polished up some stainless and stuff for us. We installed that in the field. Next thing you know, a couple days later, there's little uh, impregnated iron spots in that piece of stainless steel. We had to remove it, cut the sections out, and redo it. So try to avoid impregnating your stainless steel with the iron from steel by uh, not switching out your discs. Okay, since I'm gonna be working on stainless steel, I'm gonna go ahead and put the, uh, the Gentex papper system on, and that's simply because my beard would interfere with a respirator. Anytime you're grinding or cutting or welding on stainless steel, you should have at the source fume extraction, a papper system with uh, the, the appropriate filter or a respirator with the appropriate filter. Stainless steel contains hexavalent chromium, which is potentially hazardous. So you don't wanna be breathing that stuff in if you can avoid it, right? Use a papper system, well ventilated area, at the, fu at the source fume extraction, something to uh, protect yourself from the, the dangers of working with stainless steel, be it cutting, grinding, heating, welding, whatever the case may be. All right, so again, we got a lot of stock removal. The wheel's still in good shape. Um, came out nice and clean. Used the papper system, didn't have to worry about ingesting a whole bunch of hexavalent chromium. Any of that stuff, the, uh, the system worked great. You can't even smell this stuff when you're grinding on it, so uh, it's a pretty awesome system. I wish I would've had one of those a lot sooner. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about some wire wheels. All right, so we have the wire wheel attached. We're plugged in, everything's good to go. I uh, just want to make a special note that this is the uh, the bead profile. So this is actually going to be used on edge. So when I run this, I'm going to run it on the edge. I don't want to um, put this into a different configuration 
and run it at that 30 degree angle. It's not designed to do that. You're going to put too much pressure on these, uh, these twists right here. And what that's going to do is deform the wheel. Once you deform the wheel, you run it at high RPMs, you're going to throw this thing off balance. You don't want to do that. So always operate this on the edge. Okay, so I just threw a quick weld on top of this. The purpose of this wire wheel, uh, they're great for slag removal. If you've got little BBs in there, I've got a little bit of buckshot on here. I'll be able to take all that stuff off with this wire wheel. They're really great tools to have in your arsenal. They make cleanup a lot easier if you have access to one of these versus a chip and hammer and a wire brush. So that stuff comes off you know, relatively easy. It's very clean. It's ready to go ahead and continue welding. Okay, so this is the cut brush. It's meant to be used in the flat position. We're gonna go ahead and clean up an area right in here, but this is what you wanna use when you have to switch into a flat. So don't go using the bead brush when what you're actually looking for is a cut brush. This is for the surface, not for grooves. All right, so as you can see, between the area that we cleaned and the area that's not been cleaned, there's a significant change in the area. Um, it's, you know, a lot cleaner. All the oxides have been removed off the top of there, the surface rust. These aren't the, uh, the appropriate application for mill scale, so if that's what you're looking for, that's not what this brush is designed to do. But if you have heavy oxidized pieces, that would be the perfect tool to implement to get all that stuff cleaned up so you're ready to weld. Okay, the last wheel that we're gonna be using is the eighth inch hard rock, okay? And this wheel's actually designed, as you can tell on the front here, I can use that in the, uh, the zero to 45 degree angle as well as 90. So what's that mean? I can do an edge, I can use this to clean up the edge, but I can also turn it on its face and grind that way. So this is kind of like a, a dual purpose wheel. Um, what I'm gonna do with this, I have a, a bad section of weld on here that I'm gonna go ahead and take and remove that. It's kind of what this specific wheel was designed for, uh, removing bad welds or removing a, the, uh, cleaning up the root before you go ahead and do a hot pass. So we're gonna go ahead, clean some of this weld out, go ahead and make that appropriate repair and then we'll go ahead and test the edge out on it as well. Okay, so what I'd like to do here, I'm gonna clean off uh, about a half inch of mill scale from the back. I'm gonna clean up this edge that's been flame cut and then we'll go ahead and put a land on there. Okay, so we were able to get the mill scale cleaned off, got the, uh, the, the bevel face where we had the, uh, the flame cut, got all the carbon deposits cleaned off, put a decent land on there, and then cleaned up the backside. She's ready to weld. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. This is going to conclude this episode of Grinder Safety. So stay tuned after I get done here because we have some special uh, videos and content for you. What we did is we actually pulled our users on Instagram or our followers and asked them, hey, if you've ever been injured by a grinder, Send us some photographs of the injury and you know, tell us a little bit about what happened. We just want to drive home the fact how important the PPE is using the right tool for their job and uh, you know, especially putting a guard on the grinder. We probably had two over, over 200 submissions within about a day and a half and I would say 90% of them uh, didn't use a guard. So a guard could have eliminated or alleviated a lot of the problems that they ran into. So hope you guys appreciated watching the, uh, the video. And now without further ado, grinder accidents.
Hopefully you're still with us. And now you understand the importance of using a guard, face shield, safety glasses, appropriate tools for the right job. Uh, hope you guys learned something. Till next time, make your world better than your last.